Thank you, worship team. Isn't that a beautiful song? Just as I am, I come. What amazing love that Jesus would come from heaven down to earth to be with us. It's great to see you this morning. Merry Christmas. Turn to your neighbor and say, Merry Christmas. Turn to the neighbor you just ignore and say, it's good to see you this morning. Is anyone awake in the second service this morning? Who's already got your shoveling done? Who's already done the shoveling this morning? Who was like, nope, not doing it this morning. Maybe, maybe it'll get done later today. Yeah, well, I am so excited you are here. It's great to see you this Christmas Eve morning. Tomorrow is Christmas. Can you believe it? I hope you have your Christmas shopping done. Otherwise, you got a little bit of time left. A little bit of time. I'm Pastor Zach. I'm the middle school pastor here, and I'm so excited to share with you what God has put on my heart to share this Christmas Eve morning. Are you ready to hear this morning? All right, we're gonna start, we're gonna jump right into it. Micah chapter five, verse two. And if you have your Bible, you can then jump to Matthew chapter one, verse one. We'll be there in just a little bit. But Micah chapter five, verse two, we have a prophecy of Christmas. And it starts out like this. But you, Bethlehem, David's country, the runt of the litter. Now, if you don't know this, that's not really a compliment that he's saying right there. All right, that's not like saying, hey, you're awesome. That's saying, you, you're the smallest of, of us all. You're the weakest of us all. If that was to us, that's it. But you, Iowa, uh, the flyover state, right? But you, Iowa, the potato state, right? They, they, it would be like, what is going on here? But you, Bethlehem, the runt of the litter, from you will come the leader who will shepherd and rule Israel because big things can come from unsuspecting areas. He'll be no upstart, no pretender. His family tree is ancient and distinguished. If you're taking notes this morning because note takers are world changers, the title of the message is this, it's simple, the tree, the tree. And if you have a Bible or if you're taking notes, go ahead and write that part down. Family tree equals ancient and distinguished. We'll get back to that in just a little bit. But being Christmas, one thing I love is all the traditions that surround Christmas, right? The, the traditions of, of getting together with family, the traditions of the food we, we eat, the, the different drinks that we have, uh, the, the time spent of, of doing things on Christmas Eve, on Christmas Day, leading up to it. There's all sorts of traditions, right? But one tradition that I think most people have around Christmas is a tradition uh, involving the family tree, like the Christmas tree, right? It, it involves the, the Christmas tree. And I've come up with three different types of, of people there are out, the, out there that get Christmas trees. Uh, three different Christmas tree people. The first one is the people, they, they like to go hiking. They like to, they like to go through the snow, and it's not Christmas until they kill their own tree. Like, they gotta kill something in order for it to be Christmas. Like, if it's cold outside, if there's snow, you're hiking through it, and it's not really a Christmas until the kids are complaining that their toes are cold and that they wanna go home, right? And you're like, I gotta kill, if, if, if it's gonna go in my house, I'm killing that tree, I'm cutting it down myself. Raise your hands, that's you. You cut down your own tree. We have some, some, keep your hands up. Those are our barbarians here this morning. They're the barbarians. They're okay if they like put a family of squirrels homeless for the year. They're like, hey, it's not Christmas until, until I'm killing something, right? The second group is a little different. This group gets in their car, they drive to Home Depot or Lowe's or Hy-Vee or whatever it is, and they do their regular shopping, and then they go outside, and then they pick out their Christmas tree that someone else has already cut down. They want the street credit of having the real tree, but don't want to do the dirty work of getting it. They're the type of people that want a hamburger, but they don't want to meet the cow. You know what I'm saying? Like, like they want it, but they don't want to do the work. They, they're like, I want the street credit of that real tree, because they're like, real tree means real Christmas. Fake tree, fake Christmas, right? Adam, or Mary and Joseph, they had a, they had a real tree, so I got to have a real tree, right? If I don't have a real tree, then I'm not like Mary and Joseph. Real tree, real Christmas. So you have that group of people. Who is in that group? You, you go and you pick up your tree from the lot that's already been cut down. My hand's up. Don't be ashamed. I know there's more of you out there. I've seen those lots. They're pretty empty. The last group is this. This group doesn't, uh, they don't go for a hike to get their tree. They don't get in their car and drive to the store. They make that long journey out to the, the garage, the attic, the basement, and they wipe off the dust from last year in that box, and then they put together their fake tree. And the guys that are out there, that their job is putting lights on the tree, they bought that pre-lit tree so they don't have to do anything, right? And you put together your fake tree. Where are my fake tree people at? Wow. Fake Christmas people all around here. But at some point, those, those fake tree people, they're like, I've already got kids, I've got all this stuff, I can't keep another thing alive, so just give me the fake tree. <laughs> like, I'm struggling enough with my kids to keep them alive, give me the fake tree. 
But there's gonna be a point at Christmas when you have your tree up in the living room and the, there's lights all around it and it gets dark at night. And you know those moments where it's just the tree kind of lighting up the room and, and just those, those nice quiet moments and you gather around with your family and you've got your cup of hot chocolate and maybe you got some Bing Crosby Christmas going on, some, some Nat King Cole Christmas going on, maybe the Elvis or, or Sam Smith Christmas going on. Maybe if you got kids, Alvin and the Chipmunks Christmas going on. And you're sitting around the tree enjoying the tree. And at some point you get to tell them the Christmas story of, of Mary and Joseph and, and baby Jesus and the star and the, the angel, the shepherds, the wise men. And you're thinking, oh, that is such a cute story. This is just such a, it's so rustic and so just, it's so nice and, and beautiful and it's so cute how it all falls together. It's so Pinteresting. It's just so cute. And I, I just love every moment of anything. This is so great. But let me challenge your thinking this morning that, that Christmas looks better from a distance. It looks better from a distance. It looks good on our nativity sets. It looks good in the, the little kid plays that, that go on reenacting it, but it's better from a distance because up close, it's really kind of messy. I mean, Jesus was laid into a feeding trough. That's kind of nasty. Uh, the, the wise men, they had to escape an, an alternative route because the, there's this crazy king going around killing babies two years and, and under. Uh, Mary uh, finds out she's pregnant and tells Joseph, and he's like, I'm not marrying you. What do you mean I'm not gonna marry you? And, and they almost call off the wedding. And then he, then he gets told by an angel to, to continue marrying her, and he, so he stays with her. But there's the stigma of, of the fact that, that it's not his baby, because people can do the math. Uh, Jesus was born when? And you got married when? Oh, okay, I see what's happening here. And he's like, no, 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 it's not even my baby. You don't understand. They're like, oh, okay. So it's one of those scenarios we got going on here. It's, it's a messy story. But all of that is Matthew chapter two, Luke two, the beginning part of, the second part of Matthew chapter one. So what chapter comes before chapter two? If you didn't say that, I hope that you know that one comes before two because that's pretty simple. Well, chapter one comes before chapter two, right? And we see that all this is in chapter two, but let's look at what happened first. Maybe, maybe you've tried to read through the Bible in a year. Maybe you've been doing your devotions and you get to a chapter like this and it's got all these names and, and this person married this person and had this baby and that baby married this person. You're like, what in the, who printed a phone book from this time? Like, is this Jesus's phone book that he had going on here? You're like, what does this even mean? Be honest with me. Who's got to that point and you just skip over all the names and then start where it really starts? Be honest, I know where you are, liars or friars, don't, don't keep your hand down if, if you know that's you. But right, that, that's sometimes something that we just skip on over, like oh, all these names, okay, I'm gonna start reading right here and we jump right there. But today I wanna show you kind of what's interesting, what, I, what I've discovered that's interesting about this whole section of, of Matthew chapter one. Is that all right with you? Can we jump there? All right, we're gonna be in Matthew chapter one, starting in verse one, and we'll kind of be jumping around. If you don't have your Bible with you, that's all right. There's giant Bibles up here on the screen that you can follow along with us. Chapter one, verse one says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Verse five, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Verse six, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Verse 16, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. So what do we have here besides just a phone book of this time? What, what we have here is his, his, his bloodline, his genealogy, or if you ask Jesus, hey, what, what is all this? He'd say, oh, that, that is my family tree. That's the family tree. Now, now today our family tree, it's a little different than then. Today, if you wanna find out your family tree, you, got on, you get on Ancestry.com, you put it in, and you're like, hey, I got a family all the way back you know, to this time. Yay me, cool, let's go, right? And it's just kind of like, hey, this is what I found out. But, but for them, it was something much different. For them, if you were to compare it to something today, it would be like uh, you having a resume. It'd be, like, it'd be like your resume. When they were looking for the Messiah, there was all these things that he had to f fulfill. One of them being had to be from David, so they would check that out. And, and here we have uh, his, his resume. Like a resume, they would make it look as good as, as it could be, right? Like some of you guys have done with your resume, you make it look as good as it, it can be. You're showing like, hey, this is why I deserve to be where I'm at, this is why I deserve to get this job. They'd also uh, take out some of the stuff that maybe you don't want people to know about. Like if you're working on a resume and, and there's that one boss, you know, from that one time and it kind of ended a little messy, there was a little drama that happened at work, maybe a no call, 
no show, and now you've got this, this three years in, in your resume that's kind of empty, and you're working at it, you're applying for a new job, and they're like, what about this three years? And you're like, oh, those years, uh, I came across a lot of money and did a lot of volunteer work. I don't know what to tell you, right? But, but they would clean it up. They would take the stuff that they don't want people to know about. They'd take that out, and they put good stuff in. But what happens in Matthew is the exact opposite. Matthew doesn't try to make it look good. He doesn't try to take the bad stuff out. He puts it all out there. Can I show you what I'm talking about? The first person we see is Rahab. What's interesting about Rahab? Well, first of all, Rahab is a woman. She's not just a woman. She's the first of many women referenced in his genealogy. You see, Jesus came into a time where, where women were not elevated, where they, where they were treated much poorly. If you were to look at people's genealogy, it'd be man after man, father after father, male after male. It'd just be all men, but he includes women. And he came in this time where they did not get treated very well. But he came out with this new thinking. He, came, he brought in this new thinking of elevating women so that male and female would be equal, so that Jew and Gentile would be equal, so that slave and free would be equal, all under one Jesus Christ. So we see that she, she's a woman. Not only is she a woman, but when she's introduced to us in the Old Testament, she's introduced as Rahab the harlot or Rahab the prostitute. Now, I don't know if you've been working on your resume lately, but if you have a great-great-grandma that was a prostitute, I hope you don't have that in your resume. But Jesus, he go, they go ahead and they put it in there, showing like, hey, I, I've got this. And they're like, okay, okay, well, what, what else we got going on here? Next, we see Judah and Tamar. This, these are the parents of Perez and Zerah. Now, what's so interesting about this story? I think I got something to, to uh, whet your appetite here. We got a little bit of scandal going on here. Uh, some of you guys are like, ooh, scandal. This is like what you'd find on Netflix, on Hulu, and now you want to know more. You're like, tell me this scandal. You think it, I'm just going to go out there and tell you all these people's business, you nosy little people. want to know everybody's business. All right, I'll, I'll tell you what happened here. Well, Judah, <laughs> Judah is Tamar's father-in-law. Say, oh, oh, that's dirty. Judah is Tamar's father-in-law. But to his defense, he did think she was a prostitute when he was first with her. So refer to previous branch on the tree, right? We see that's in the tree. So, so he brings up Judah and Tamar, and they're saying, oh, why do you got to tell us about that? Because they know this is all Old Testament stuff. They know what's going on. They're like, why do you need to tell us about Judah and Tamar? Just get us to David, and we'll move on. He says, ah, funny you bring up David because that's the story in itself. When it, when it refers to David, it says, David, father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. That's a past marriage. So why are we bringing in past marriages? Uh, we, we see that uh, we have this other thing introduced into our tree called adultery. Adultery is introduced. I don't know if you know who, who, who had been Uriah's wife, but that is Bathsheba. And David was with Bathsheba. Maybe you don't know who Uriah is. Uriah was one of David's bodyguards, one of his soldiers. So David got into war, and, and while David should have been out fighting war, he was home, and Uriah was out fighting it for him. And what does he say? Thank you, Uriah, for fighting a war for me. I'm going to go ahead and sleep with your wife. And, and we see adultery is entered into that. But not only, do we, not only does David end with adultery, but Merry Christmas, everybody. We got murder to the family tree. Add that on there. Because he, he gets scared that Uriah is going to find out what happened. So he has Uriah put on the front line so that he will be killed, so that he won't know. So David, this guy that everybody wants to be related to, Jesus points out, hey, he uh, is the father of someone who had been Uriah's wife. Like, what, what do we got going on there? We have past marriages bringing up. He's saying, this is a messy tree. So what we have here is Jesus' tree. We got prostitution, scandal, adultery, murder, and I haven't even got to the top yet. Not a star, not an angel, but Merry Christmas, everybody, from idolatry. We see all throughout this family tree, we see that, that there's pe different people groups intermarrying with each other. It's not just uh, Jews marrying Jews. It's not just uh, them staying together, but we see all these different people groups. We see Ruth, and we see all these different groups that are intermarrying. Now, this would be very common in that time, that, that it, there would be all sorts of intermarrying, and no one would just be pure blood. But no one's going to brag about that. No, no one's going to put that. They're going to they're gonna try to hide that. But Jesus, he brags about it. He, he, he puts it all out there. He owns the messiness of his tree which is only appropriate because of the mess that humanity is in because of a tree. Reminds me of a story. I was reading this story of this, this woman in Australia last Christmas. All right, last Christmas, this woman in Australia, uh, it, it's Christmas time, and she wakes up one morning, 
She goes down to get a cup of coffee and she gets her coffee and she goes into her living room to admire her tree. And, it, and it, it's got the lights on and she's sitting around looking at it. She's like, oh, look at the lights on my tree. Probably a real tree because real tree, real Christmas. But she's like, oh, look at the, look at the lights on my tree. Look, look at the ornaments. Look at that tinsel that I put on my tree. It looks so good. Wait a second. I didn't put tinsel on my tree. What is that? She looks a little bit closer and this is what she sees. That's a snake in her tree, if you didn't realize. That's a snake in the woman's tree. So what does she do? She, of course, takes a picture of it, right? Like, what else are you going to do in the moment? You got to take a picture of that. She takes a picture of it, and she calls animal control. Good thing she did, because she comes out, uh, finds out that it's, it's a tiger snake, which is actually, I guess, one of the, a very dangerous snake in Australia. But what story does this remind us of? A snake in a tree going all the way back to Genesis, right? the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So we, we now see that there's this story. So we're gonna read that Genesis chapter three, starting in verse two, it says, the woman said to the serpent, not at all, we can eat from the trees in the garden. It's only the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, don't eat from it, don't even touch it, or you'll die. The serpent told the woman, you won't die. God knows that the moment you eat from that tree, you'll see what's really going on. You'll be just like God, knowing everything ranging all the way from good to evil. When the woman saw that the tree looked like good eating and realized that she would realize what she would get out of it, she'd know everything. She took and ate the fruit and then gave some to her husband, and he ate it. And that very next moment, they died right on the spot. Now, someone here might be saying, wait a second. Wait a second, Pastor Zach, I don't think they died on the spot. Didn't they go on to have Cain and, and Abel, and they, they lived a lot longer? But you're thinking of physical death. Really, there's two deaths. There's physical death, and then there's spiritual death. Spiritual death looks like this. If you go to cut down your Christmas tree, you go and you cut it down, and you take it off from its source of life. You take it home, and you put it in your living room, and you decorate it up. At first, it looks much, it might even look better than what it looked like outside, but, but it, it, you have it all decorated up, but slowly, by the time January, by the time New Year's rolls around, that tree's gonna be brown, it's gonna be dead. See, spiritual death doesn't just happen in a moment, it happens over time. See, sin separates us from God, and, and sin always ends in death. You can have nice things. You can have the new iPhone X. You can have the nicest shoes. You can have the most social media followers of anybody. You can have a, a great job where you make tons of money. You can have the newest, nicest car. You can have the biggest house. You can have the most perfect family, the, the greatest husband, the most beautiful wife. You, you, can, you can give a lot of money and time to volunteering at places. But what you'll find is that we are created to know God and apart from him, all you'll find is emptiness and loneliness. Take a minute and look around. Just look around and look at every person here. You'll notice that everybody here looks different. They look different, they talk different, they act different. Some people like Chinese food, others like Mexican food, some like rap music, others like country music, I'm sorry for you. Uh, we, we have all these different types of people, some like sports, some like art, some like music. We, we have all sorts of different types of people. But what you'll find is that we all have one thing in common. You will die. Merry Christmas, everyone. You're gonna die. Some of us here is like, ah, oh, this guy is so mean. Like, what kind of Christmas message? Tell me I'm gonna die. Who do you think you are? Well, that's, a, that's the reality, we're all gonna die. And to die physically while being dead spiritually means that you'll be separated from God forever. Right? Say it like forever. Right? Let me say that again. To die physically while being dead spiritually means that you're going to be separated from God forever, which the Bible describes as hell. And you might say, well, that doesn't seem like too bad of a place. Like, all my friends are going there and it's just going to be a big party. Well, let me tell you what the Bible describes as hell weeping and gnashing of teeth. Eternal flame. I don't know if you ever actually touched the stove and burned your hand. That's hot. That's going to hurt. Eternal flames. But that's not what God has for you. That, that's not what God wants for you. You say, well, what kind of, of loving God sends people to hell? God doesn't, God doesn't send people to hell. He doesn't choose which people come to heaven. He gives us this thing called free will. And he's not gonna violate your free will. He's gonna let it be your choice of what you decide. But that's not what God intends for you. That's not what God wants for you. So while Adam and Eve were in the garden and they became separated from God, the story doesn't end there. See, when we pick up in verse 14, it now says this. God told the serpent, 
Because you've done this, you're cursed. Cursed beyond all cattle and wild animals. Cursed to slink on your belly and eat dirt all your life. I'm declaring war between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He'll wound your head, you'll wound his heel. You get a heel wound, that's gonna hurt. You get a head wound, you're done. God says, Satan, I am going to kill you. And on Christmas, he makes good on his promise by sending his son Jesus to earth. You see, God gave you a Christmas gift. He gave you a Christmas gift, but his gift didn't go under the tree. Rather, his gift to you went on the tree. He gave you a Christmas gift. Jesus came to earth to seek and to save the lost. You might say, well, Christmas is my favorite holiday. I would, I would say, well, maybe it's not a holiday. I'm saying, what do you mean? Christmas is a rescue mission. You might be saying, I don't wanna become a Christian because I might have to give this thing up and I might have to start doing this thing. I might have to leave this group of people that I like to hang out with because they do stuff that I'm not supposed to do and there's all this going on. It's, it's too messy for me. Rescue missions are messy. Maybe you don't know, but sometimes paramedics, they gotta break people's ribs in order to do CPR. Sometimes the lifeguards gotta knock someone out in order to really save them. Sometimes firemen, they gotta take an ax and knock down a door in order to get into the burning house. No one's saying, man, if I, my house is on fire, I don't wanna deal with the mess of someone knocking down my door with an ax. Don't you even think about coming into my house. That's what this is, it. that's what this is. Jesus saying, I wanna save you from that. I, I, I wanna be there for you. Come to me, come, come follow me. Christmas is all about Easter. Christmas is all about Jesus coming and dying on a cross for you. See, Jesus came into this world with, with the blood of a murderer, a, a prostitute, with scandal, adultery, idolatry, showing that Christmas is for everyone. Christmas it is it's for the shepherds, it's for the wise men, it, it's for the corrupt king. Christmas is for the sinners. Christmas is it's for the rich, it's for the poor, it's for the old, it's for the young, it's for the grandmas, the, the grandpas, it's for the moms, the dads, the brothers, the sisters, the fathers, the mothers. Christmas is for everyone. It's for you and it's for you and it's for you. You might say, I'm so far from God, it's for you still. God's saying, you can't be too far from me. I've got this gift for you, it's Jesus. Now at the beginning, I talked about how, how his family tree is ancient and distinguished. You might be saying, well, what part of, of this is ancient and distinguished? This, that, that family tree you had up here, that, that looks, that looks kind of like my family tree. It's messy, right? What, what part of that is so great? Well, I only gave you one side of the family tree. I gave you his mother's side. His father's side is, is much shorter than that. It's John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So with one hand, he took the hand of, of all the sin of humanity, and with other hand, he took the hand of his perfect father, and he brought back what was once lost in the garden. See, Jesus came to, to die for your sins. He, he came and he died for your sins, but he didn't just die for you. He died as though he were you, taking your place that you should have had to pay. He paid the price for you. And the biggest question this Christmas is this, will you accept Jesus into your life? Will you accept him into your life? Will, will you begin to live for him? And you might say, well, what does that look like, Pastor Zach? What, what does that look like that I, I would give my life up for him? It looks like when you, when you buy a car or when you sell your car and you sign the title over and you, you give it over saying, I, I give ownership to you. That's you signing over saying, God, I give you ownership of my life. Wherever you call me, I will go. Whatever you say to me, I will go. I, I will be in my word and I, I will obey what you have called me to do. Will you accept Jesus into your life? First Peter 2.24 says this. It says, he used his servant body to carry our sins to the cross so we could be rid of sin, free to live the right way. His wounds became your healing. He came and he died for us, taking your place. He came to the tree for you. If you bow your head and close your eyes this morning, no one looking around. This morning, if you'd say, Pastor Zach, uh, I've heard you talk about Jesus coming to earth and, and dying for my sins and, and if I wanna accept him into my life and today for the first time in my life, I wanna accept him into my life. But today for the first time, I wanna say, you know what, I'm gonna move out of my ways, I'm gonna move past my old ways and I'm gonna begin to follow Jesus. If that's you with no one looking around, you'd say, Pastor Zach, today I wanna give my life to Jesus. Would you raise your hand just so I can see just between you and God, I see your hands. First time you're, you're saying, I, I'm doing this. I see your hands. 
The, the next group is this. Uh, you say, Pastor Zach, I, I've, I've made this decision before. Maybe you come to church every weekend and you're just kind of stuck in a spot and you're saying, you know what? Today I've realized that I need to change some stuff in my life. Jesus came to die for me, even though, even though I would know right from wrong and still choose wrong. But today I wanna move past those ways. Today I wanna move past those old ways of doing things, past the wrong, past the hurt, past the shame. And today I wanna begin following Jesus. I wanna rededicate my life to him. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I see your hands up all over. We're gonna, if, if you just continue to keep your head bowed and eyes closed, and would, this, would everyone here just repeat after me in this prayer? Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to earth to save me. I believe that you are God's son. Thank you for dying on the cross. Please forgive me of my sins. From this moment on, I am living for you and you alone. Amen. With everyone looking around, eyes open, part of being a Christian, part of following Jesus isn't just making that decision in your heart, but it, it, it's going public with your faith. It's going public with your faith. And we're, we're in a place of people who all believe the same thing. And if you, can't, if you can't go public with your faith in a place where everybody believes the same thing, how do you expect to go public with your faith at work? where people believe different things at school, wherever that is, at, at your family Christmas where there's people who aren't Christians. Today, I wanna give you the opportunity to go public with your faith. Maybe you raised your hand today and it was your first time. Maybe today it was your hundredth time raising your hand. Maybe today you're like, no, things are going well in my life, but today I'm saying I'm going public with my faith. I, I'm saying uh, this isn't something I'm just gonna hold in here at, at church. Uh, this is not something I'm just gonna do on Sundays or on Wednesday nights. You see, Jesus said, if you deny me before your friends, I'm gonna deny you before my father. And we, we, gotta, we gotta go public with our faith. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna count down from three. And when I get to one, if you're ready to go public with your faith, you're saying, I'm, I'm serious in this. I, I'm gonna take Jesus for real. Then that's your moment to stand. And we wanna celebrate what you're deciding to choose today. We, we wanna celebrate that choice that, that you're saying, I'm going public with this. So if that's you and you're ready to go public with your faith, say, faith saying, Jesus, just as I am, I come. Jesus, I know I make mistakes. Jesus, I know I'm going through depression. I know I'm going through hurt, through shame, through guilt, through doubt. But today, I'm following you. Today, I'm going public. If that's you in three, two, one, your decision. decision you can make you've just made saying Jesus I'm following you saying Jesus I move past my past I move past the, the, the doubt, I move past the addictions, I move past the sin, past the lust past, past the guilt, the shame I move past that and I come just as I am to you because you came just as you were to me and today uh, what, what better way to, to finish celebrating Christmas Eve morning than worshiping God saying thank you Jesus, worshiping him, what amazing love he's given us. So as we, as we get ready to close here, I just wanna end in worship. Today, if you made the decision to, to follow Jesus, if you've made that decision, we got some materials and some people that wanna connect with you out there at the Fresh Start Center when you leave. We want you to know that, that you are part of the New Hope family. Today, if this was your first time coming and maybe you just showed up, we want you to know you never have to be invited to come. It never has to be a special occasion to come. You're part of the family. We want you to feel welcomed here. Tonight is our Christmas Eve uh, candlelit service. Make sure you come back. It's a totally different service. Maybe you're like, thank God that pastor's Zach's not preaching again, right? He tells me I'm gonna die. But, but we're gonna have a totally different message tonight. And we wanna see you there with your friends, your family. But let's celebrate Jesus coming to earth with worshiping him this morning.